Foundation, which is an sorry, which is like a nonprofit which helps uh, children. And um, I will let uh, Dr. Kanso take it from here. She can add uh, more. But thank you for being here. And today's talk we had thought would be more of a question answer format. So Dr. Kanso will speak for a bit. Uh, do put in your questions in the chat. Uh, there was a Google form sent out by the school, by uh, our principal. So uh, there are a few questions there. I can re uh, read those off and Dr. Kanso will answer, but if anything comes up, please feel free to keep putting in your questions in the chat. Thank you. It's all you. Thank you, Shruti, for that uh, warm welcome. Thank you, Cindy. Uh, it's it's good to be back to, uh, you know, the school where my daughter was uh, there for a couple of years, uh, a couple of years ago. So it's it. I was very humbled when um, Shruti and Cindy reached out to me to come back, and I was like, absolutely, I love CMS and the community. So um, thank you again for having me over. So I'm going to. Um, share a few slides uh, and talk a little bit about, you know, what is stress, what is anxiety, what's the difference between those two things and how, you know, the pandemic has affected us in, in those two ways. And then obviously uh, we'll open it up to question answer session. Um, I, I think some of you have filled out that Google form, so we may have some questions already, but like Shruti said, you could also put it in chat box and I'm happy to take as many I can in the next hour. So let me pull up my slides here. Okay, can everybody see the slides? Perfect. Oops. Okay, so I, I'm not gonna go over my introduction again. As Shruti mentioned, I'm a child adolescent and adult psychiatrist. I have a private practice here in Los Altos under the name of Silicon Valley Psychiatry. I am a co-founder and president of Tarika Foundation whose mission is to create mental health awareness in children and teens. And through that, we do a lot of educational talks and. Um, happy to be here to do one today. And then um, I trained at Stanford both for my adult and child training and I'm uh, on their Action clinical faculty now. So happy to uh, give back uh, to my alma mater. So, you know, um, let's talk about what is stress. I think um, we use this term all the time. <laughs> Little kids use this term these days. Um, you know, it used to be, that only adults use this term, but you know, interestingly now, even kindergartners or first graders or elementary school kids are often like, I'm stressed, I'm stressed out. Uh, so what is stress? Like, you know, let's uh, understand it more from the scientific uh, kind of perspective. Um, so it's, it's, it's defined as an organisms, anybody, any living beings, total response to environmental demands or pressures. Uh, in a medical or biological context, uh, stress is a physical, mental, or emotional factor that causes bodily or mental tension. So some of us, you know, feel it in our body and feel I'm stressed and I'm, you know, feeling this ache or pain or the stress in certain parts of my body. And we'll talk about the physiology in, a, in the next few slides. And, um, you know, often there is a trigger or what we call as a stressor that brings on stress. Uh, stresses can stressors can be external, uh, so from the environment, uh, from you know how our, our uh, psychological uh, state of mind is because of external circumstances and social or social situations, and then sometimes it could be very much internal from dealing with a change in our body, whether it is related to sickness or any medical procedures. So uh, you know. I think we had a very big environmental uh, as well as psychological stressor. Um, and I think it overlaps into social as well when the pandemic started. And I think clearly it was a, uh, it came from nowhere. We got blindsided by this like whole thing, like, oh, 
you need to lock yourself up and stay home to be safe. And that was an adjustment. Um, and then um, another way to describe stress is your body's response to anything that disrupts your normal life and routine. So these are just, you know, different ways you can understand what stress could be. Now, the next question is, is stress really good or bad? Uh, I'm sure you guys know about um, this, but I'm going to just quickly review that, you know, not all stress is bad. I think we, we know that, like we say that little stress is actually needed to feel motivated and to be, um, you know, also uh, committed to our responsibilities and commitments, right? If, if I didn't uh, took a little bit of a stress about being on time for this talk, I would be late and then you would never invite me. So I, I want to be like on time. So I'm going to like make sure I rush from my work and get ready and be here on time. Right. So that that's what good stress is. Um, but obviously, you know, um, we need to have just the right amount. Right. Once it starts to or encroach about, upon if it's like not just one little episodic stress, but it's like an ongoing stream of stress from different sources. Um, it actually starts to make me tired. It affects my efficiency, my productivity, and often burnout and, and anxiety, depression, those types of things can come on the other side. So, um, so I think, you know, like anything, <laughs> you know, we need to have the right balance uh, is what, what is kind of the, the thing here. Like we have to have the right amount of stress for being more focused, more energetic, we'll be more resilient and, 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 you know, kind of go about doing things in life. Um, you know, we can talk about stress in three different types. Uh, acute is where, you know, it's an occasional stressful situation. Uh, I think some, of you might be like, oh, riding a roller coaster is not a great example. <laughs> For me, I, I actually, roller coasters are stressful. So I, I would say that's an acute stress for me, my body and, you know, um, my psychological state is definitely shaken by that. Um, there can be episodic stress that, you know, can come in spurts and it can be, um, you know, kind of in some ways, like, you know, we can say, um, the pandemic actually did kind of, in some ways, there was an overlap in all, sorry, all three of these, like it was an acute stressor. And initially we thought, oh, this is going to be a few, few months and, you know, we'll be out of this. And then, uh, then came a time we got used to being, you know, in, in lockdown and, and so forth. And then, you know, starting when we started having vaccination, there were spurts of like, oh, this is a good patch. Now you can step out. So it, it became kind of episodic in some ways. And then of course, overall cumulative, cumulatively, this was a very chronic long period of being in that kind of stress, uh, uncertainty, and not sure whether this is going to end. Um, so what, what do we see in terms of symptoms when you are stressed? Um, this is not uh, uncommon for a lot of people. They may not perceive it more psychologically that they are stressed out, but their body might be giving them signs about, you know, certain symptoms. So I just have some, you know, symptoms here like headaches, muscle tension, fatigue, change in mood, upset stomach, feeling dizzy, change in appetite. Um, and then we know that, you know, this, these things happen because clearly there is a, a physiology behind this. So we, you know, have stress hormones that are released from our pituitary gland uh, in, up in the brain. So whenever we perceive anything that's a challenge or a stress or a change, um, you know, there is stress hormones that are released and obviously they have impact on different body organs. And that's why, you know, you may experience symptoms like stomach issues or, you know, in, in acute a stressful state, you may feel like, oh, I'm sweating, I'm feeling a little warm or cold, clammy uh, hands. And those are, th those are like signs of episodic good stress. If you're like giving a presentation and if you're nervous about that, that's kind of how our body, our body reacts. But then we understand that chronic stress or constant, you know, impact of that uh, on our body does lead to a lot of health issues. Um, so shifting gears, 
what's anxiety? <laughs> you know, um, a lot of the times, you know, we are finding that people are using these terms interchangeably. Um, they often say stress. And now, you know, I hear more of like, I'm anxious, not necessarily the word stressed out or stress. And I mean, they, they, the physiology behind those two things is very similar. Uh, to a certain extent, it's somewhat acceptable to use them interchangeably. But essentially, anxiety is kind of a byproduct of ongoing stress or the, the intensity of stress or how much you know uh, uh, the stress is impacting you and how well you're able to cope with it or not. Um, so it's, a, it's, it's more of like a, a reaction to being under stress. Um, you know, anxiety could be also defined as persistent excessive worries that don't go away when in absence of stressor. So some of us are now feeling like the pandemic has become an endemic, but does that mean that it's going to change again? What if a new variant comes? What if this, uh, how are we going to go back to being locked up again? Um, and so, the, I mean, those, those are kind of some natural worries, but if they are persistent and excessive and they are starting to interfere with your day-to-day -day life where it starts to impact your sleep or concentration issues happen, you're more irritable and worried and is preoccupied by this worry. And when it starts to affect your day-to-day -day life, that's when it becomes an anxiety disorder. So usually our goal is to catch things uh, early while it is at the stress stage uh, and not let it progress to anxiety and then eventually anxiety disorder. Um, you know, again, um, anxiety is a normal emotion that we all have. Uh, it's meant to be mostly protective. If we go back, you know, millions of years back when our ancestors were in the caves, we had to um, you learn to fight, flight, or freeze given the external dangers we were surrounded by back then. So if there was, you know, a big animal walking your way, you would, um, you know, flight or freeze. Um, if you had a small, you know, animal that you can fight, you fought. So the that kind of has been kind of how we, you know, how we see anxiety as a positive thing. It helps us to protecting ourselves, it helps with survival, it helps us to be ready to be, be um, productive, be motivated and be successful mostly. But again, it needs to be in that right amount. Uh, when when um, we have constant stimulus of stress and resulting into anxiety, um, then that can go on the other side where you start having these symptoms a lot more times or all the time. So, um, you know, I think, you know, just to have a perspective, I'm again, if if I am um, feeling a little bit panicked about the news of a new strain of the virus coming, it's not like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm, I have like panic attack or an anxiety disorder. It's like, oh, this is just my body's reaction to the fear that, oh, am I going to lose my normalcy again? So very important to distinguish. And again, the idea is to understand where we can catch and how we can actually change the course from it becoming worse over time. Um, this is like, you know, again, like if I can um, catch it before it, it goes to the peak and then I come on the other side, this is where I can, um, you know, uh, lead to um, it's kind of, this is kind of a nice kind of thing to remember that, you know, if I'm dealing with some stress, I'm not able to adjust. I'm not able to still like relax after the stressor is gone and not reduce its impact. Then, you know, I, I should start to look at how I can uh, take care of myself before I, you know, you know, get into the other zone of now this is starting to encroach my life. So I, I thought this was just a little bit relevant to give you a perspective on um, not everything we react that is stressful is problematic uh, and you need to like seek help. But again, the spectrum is what we need to be watching at and, and make sure we are catching ourselves and doing right things to cope with it. So we don't, you know, end up on the other side where it starts to affect our day-to-day -day living and, and, and happiness. 
So I, I you know, want to take a pause there and um, open it up for questions. Um, and you know, uh, happy to like answer any questions if you have about the slides also I have presented so far. Thank you, uh, Dr. Kanzot. Um, I think the slides which talked about how our body uh, responds and reacts, it really was very informative. Like, I was like, I, I checked off so many boxes on that. So um, thank you. Uh, let me read off some of the questions that came on the form. And then in the meantime, uh, guys, if you have any questions, please do uh, add them to the chat. Uh, we cannot pinpoint the cause, but my kids started to pick their skin heavily a while ago. I believe it's caused by anxiety. We've gotten used to it, but I wonder if I should take them to a doctor. The picking is leaving scars on their skin. What's the criteria I should use to make the decision? Yeah, uh, very good question. So, um, you know, I guess in, I'll, I'll give you a little bit education about uh, this particular symptom, uh, how we how we evaluate it and how we categorize it. Um, so th these kinds of um, behaviors where if your child is engaging in skin picking or nail biting uh, excessively or hair pulling or um, eyelash pulling sometimes also happens for some people. These are now known as body focused repetitive behaviors, BFRBs is the acronym. Um, you know, they, they used to be considered as OCD related behaviors uh, until more recently when the new DSM, our diagnostic manual came out, they started to say, no, this is a whole separate, they, they have that flavor of OCD in, in a sense that you have this obsessive thought that this is bothering me and I need to peel the scab or I need to pull on my skin. And that's like your compulsive behavior. Um, but it, these are, uh, you know, um, there is more to it than just it's related to, to kind of anxiety or OCD. Um, so we do know that, that, you know, these types of um, behaviors, uh, if, if, you're, if you're seeing it in your child, do often come, come with additional anxiety symptoms or often anxiety is driving some of these behaviors. Um, it's not that it's the cause. Often it is that, you know, it may be once in a while, you know, I, I saw this bump and I, I pulled it and that there was some sense of relief of tension or, or stress. And then my brain got this message that, oh, you know, that felt good. And so next time I feel this, and then when I'm stressed and anxious, I'm more fidgety, I'm more likely to go back to that as a way of coping is kind of how it kind of gets reinforced. Um, so, you know, there, there are a lot of, uh, of course, uh, good treatments out there. Um, when to seek help, it is uh, important to understand how frequently your child is engaging in this how often, you know, or how intensely are they having damage that's happening because of this behavior. Um, and if, if it's like only progressing and you've tried a few things like, you know, tell him to distract and do something else, engage his hands in doing something else or fidgets and it's not working. And if it's only progressing, um, then definitely it's good to get help sooner than later. I wouldn't wait too long in general, there is a very um, nice evidence-based uh, psychological treatment or therapy called um, COMB. It's a comprehensive uh, kind of uh, behavioral therapy. Essentially, I won't go over the medical terms too much. Uh, but there is a, a, a you know, the there is definitely a um, lot of tools the child can learn from working with these therapists who specialize in this type of behavioral therapy to find ways to break this behavior. Um, so there are components such as like, you know, um, I mean, common things that we advise are, you know, uh, 
identify some of those high risk situations where you see your child doing this more often. So often, you know, there would be like, oh, whenever we are um, sitting idle and watching TV as a family, that's when I see, you know, boredom or like, you know, having not, not much going on with school or fidgets. That's when, you know, I see the kid pulling it or uh, when he's stressed about the test next day, it could be, or whenever we are in the car, on the car ride to school, when he has not else going on is strapped in the seat belt and sitting that's when his hand goes there so it could be different for different kids but essentially if you're noticing that there are certain situations your child is engaging in those behaviors um, then it is uh, really important to kind of plan ahead and we say carry things that would engage his hands in you know other things so carrying a small bag with some fidget toys um clipping the nails really you know as much as you can um, we also say putting some greasy lotion or ointment on the fingertips so the impact is not as much um, sometimes you know people put bandages and again the idea is what we understand is that this is a very reinforcing it's a there's a physiological basis to this that once once the brain gets that message that oh this was fun or this was kind of nice uh, you are tempted to go back to doing it. It becomes like a habit. And, uh, you know, so you have to break the behavior. So sometimes it's very hard to just say, stop doing it, because the more you say, stop doing it, they'll, there'll be higher urge to do it. But if you can actually um, not, you know, say stop, but give them tools, like, why don't you use your fidgets? Why don't you doodle? Right. Let's make sure your nails are clipped. Let's make sure your, your fingertips are you know, greasy or we put some band-aids or barriers like, you know, for hair pulling, we often say wear a hat. So you're less tempted if your long hairs are the temptation to pull, you tie them up. So there are different behavioral strategies um, that, that can be used. And um, along with that, there is also like focus on relaxation or stress management strategies like reducing anxiety in general, like breathing techniques and progressive muscle relaxation. So in general, like, you know, you're approaching it from uh, different angles where we are giving them tools to manage their stress and find other ways to manage stress rather than going to this. And you're also giving tools to break that behavior. And once that reinforcement loop between the behavior and the brain is broken, there's a very good chance they kind of break, you know, you, you do, they don't go back to it. So, yeah, so I would say, you know, if, if there's enough uh, concern you have, you should seek help. And the, so, the earlier the intervention, the sooner, you know, there would be some out, you know, r relief and success uh, because we can, if we catch it early, we can, you know, break it early kind of a thing. Thank you, Dr. Kamsa. The next question is, um, my child seems to do too much homework. The child comes home and is doing homework till dinner, then gets up and then does homework after dinner and then does homework again. Uh, puts too much pressure to try and perform well. The idea of self-worth seems to come from grades and the child is very anxious. Hmm. How, how can one help this child? Yeah, so uh, I have to say not uncommon for, uh, unfortunately, for me to see kids, in, in especially in our area where there is so much emphasis on uh, academic performance and grades. And I, I see the stress even middle schoolers are facing these days, forget about high schoolers. Uh, there's almost this dread that they carry from middle school that, oh my gosh, I'm gonna go to high school and then I have to get into a good college and that's why I have to study hard. So I think uh, it's, it's, it's uh, frankly, I mean, I, I feel bad for them. I know they are in a very privileged area, seeing a lot of successful parents around them, but I think there is some damage that has caused, been caused by, you know, how much uh, they feel that pressure uh, from not, I'm not seeing parents, I'm actually seeing the reverse in my practice in the last few years. Parents are saying back off, like, you know, your question, the person who put this question, I, I know you are like, I don't want him to study so much. I don't want him to do homework all evening, all night, but he seems to be so driven. And, and so 
I think my, you know, advice, uh, it, it can, I mean, there can be many things, but the main few things that I want to highlight that you could try is to, if he's feeling like his self-worth resides in grades and that's the way to prove himself and that's the way to measure himself, um, you know, I think uh, you, you have to make effort to help him build or recognize his self-worth in other things too, which I'm, I'm sure you might be doing, but, um, you know, making, making the child aware that um, self-worth can come from external assets. And then there is also internal assets that we all have that actually take us, you know, uh, in the long run, that's what helps us to be actually more successful. So the idea is, of course, not to, to not to motivate, not to demoralize and not to decrease the child's motivation. But the idea is to help them understand that perfection is not needed. You know, like I think that perfectionism that some some anxious kids have that those traits and they really work hard and they want to do things perfectly and that's why maybe he needs longer time to finish the same homework that his classmate might be finishing in two hours but he he may have high standards for himself for it has to look this good it has to be this quality work which is good I mean perfectionism pays off uh, you know but I think it's important to help the child understand that it's not sustainable like, you know, today you are in seventh grade or eighth grade and you have, you know, two hours worth of homework and you can take four hours to finish it. Uh, then you go to high school, then you go to college, the demands are only going to go higher. And, you know, focusing on self care and having that balance of like allowing to let go and being little okay with sub quality work. Again, it's not going to be bad work, but from their measure, um, and, and allowing them to say it's, it's fine. Like, you know, even if you did it this way, it's not easy. Uh, you know, I, I can, I can tell you it, it, it's not like you're going to tell him and they'll get it. Sometimes you have to get professional help for somebody to actually talk about the pros and cons of holding on to this kind of belief, uh, of perfectionism and allowing to kind of see like, okay, what are the downsides? How, how is this helping me or hurting me and why I need to work on letting go. But then also focusing on helping them find their worth in other things. If they are being a, a really um, a good older brother to their younger sibling, appreciating their kindness and their sharing, uh, appreciating their honesty, appreciating you know the internal assets, the compassion, things that we know as adults now, like even though we all have been successful in, in schools. And when we came to the job world, our, our, besides our qualification, we know that, that that was a stepping stone, but what really helps you thrive and lets you be like, you know, a person who can and sustain success is your internal assets. We all know that, like, you know, we are definitely seeing more and more of people are looking for team, you know, are you a team builder? What are your qualities? How do you get along with people? How kind you are? How understanding you are? So I think making a conscious effort to recognize your child for those things and helping them see self-worth in those things as well. Again, not to undermine their academic performance and their intelligence, but also giving them the message that it's the whole you, like, you know, one aspect of you is not what makes you, you. But there are other parts of you that makes you you and you are unique the way you are and appreciating, you know, catching them being good with their behavior, appreciating them for validating them for things that they they feel. Um, and then certainly, like I said, you know, if, if you're feeling like the anxiety is only, you know, going up and it's, it's starting to maybe affect their sleep, they are staying up to do the work perfectly because that's how they want it to be and it's compromising their sleep then it may not be a bad idea to have them see a counselor who can work also on some you know, ways to manage anxiety in a more effective way, learn some effective tools uh, to manage that and kind of set the stone, you know, set, set it for um, you know, where they have the tools to manage stress later on because it's only going to go higher in high school and college and future uh, in future. So, yeah. Yeah, life. Um, in line with that, Denise said, I'm having a similar issue. My son is a sixth grader. 
and on some mornings starts crying at the thought of going to school. They say no one is hurting them, but that one of the teachers is mean and talks harshly to the students. They don't want to go to school. Is there a way to help him? Hmm. May I ask, was this something that started just recently or this has been going on since like we came back in person to schools? I don't know if the... Uh, it's been going on since, since school started, like this school year, right? When everybody went back in person. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, um, we are seeing some of some of those uh, challenges with some kids also. Um, if you think about it, you know, this is a big transition, right? Like we went from being in person, being in normalcy to suddenly being shut down for a year and a half. Um, and, and maybe a little over that and um, transitioning back to, um, oh, they also switch schools. So that's actually a very big change. Um, so I, I'm sure, you know, on top of like the changes that pandemic brought in our life, there has been these big changes where they moved, you're coming to a new school, suddenly you are you know coming to a big campus and meeting so many kids and new teachers and 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 getting into a routine so that can be anxiety inducing definitely and some kids have more of that reaction or response and they may be more anxious about this so um you know often people with anxiety like i said you know we cope by fight flight or freeze um lot of the times you know kids uh choose the avoidance or freeze or flight as a way of coping with anxiety. And, and so, um, you know, just kind of like, oh, this is too stressful. This is too overwhelming. I'd rather not go. If I kind of put a wall and say this problem doesn't exist, then my problem is solved is kind of how they think about it. And so often they will say, I don't want to go because, um, you know, it's, 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 it's too much for them that they can manage or handle. So, you know, we, we call if this is going on for some time and you're avoiding or not being able to make at school, it, we call it as school refusal, which is just understand basically a byproduct of longstanding anxiety about this prop, this kind of place or this transition. Um, so there are definitely like ways to work through that. Um, you, of course, need some more professional help uh, than just being able to do it just with school support. Uh, but essentially, again, there is a, a, a plan that we create where we, instead of having a full expectation that you will go tomorrow for the full day of school, which can be too much and overwhelming for the child, uh, it could start with, okay, let's start going to, you know, just the lunch break or a fun, easy class, and then you just kind of build upon that. Um, of course, you know, we also... Um, have to get support from school often you know I've had kids like be able to go and talk to the school counselor if they are struggling even in that short period they're initially going um, so so it, it is uh, it is something that takes a little bit of work um, it, uh, you know uh, the child obviously has to also see a therapist to understand who can understand what are some of the challenges with this school is this just one teacher, as he's saying? Is it more than that? Are the kids bullying or teasing him? Is there, you know, again, like understanding, uh, is this just more the child who's being, you know, feeling like he's out of place because of this new environment? Or is it uh, more than that? Um, and, and based on that, we, of course, work on the environmental pieces as well. Um, so, yeah, so I, I can, you know, definitely tell you that if we do in a in a stepwise manner and you know often we also create behavioral plans and stuff we reward the okay if you, you went to one class yay, great you know there's so many points and then just like you know we did sticker charts in 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 younger days for them to do or shape their behavior there's kind of a similar philosophy in this also while we are addressing sources of anxiety that could be addressed thank you Dr. Kansal. The next one is my middle schooler daughter is looking stressed while I'm driving to school to drop her in the morning. This is happening since the last three to four weeks. 
uh, when we asked her, uh, she's not ready to share anything. Any advice on how to handle this situation uh, to try and understand or get the information about what is going on with her? Mm. Yeah, so, you know, um, it's it's a challenge once the kids get into preteen, teen phase, they often are, um, you know, not as open and forthcoming and some are more introverted than others. So I don't know what her kind of uh, personality has been like to begin with. Um, and, and of course, you know, as a parent, you're seeing there's a change and I want to know what's going on and you're trying and if they are not opening up, I wouldn't, you know, uh, I mean, it, it's discouraging and disappointing, obviously, but I wouldn't uh, take that as like, oh, you know, my child is not valuing me as a parent or something wrong I did has been the reason for this or anything. I think a lot of the times um, kids who are going through anxiety uh, or any stress, they feel like sharing their burden with their parents is going to overburden them or sharing their problems is going to make them more worried. So, you know, usually kids are more sensitive and, and more uh, uh, aware and responsible about these things than we think. Um, so a lot of the times that could be a reason and that that is why they are not telling you because they, they see you are already, you know, stressed or whatever. If you're having already stuff on your plate, they don't want to add it. But that being said, we can't let that slide. So uh, encouraging them to talk to another person they trust. And sometimes it, it could be another family member. If you have extended family here, sometimes it could be a friend's parent, another their friend's parent, if they feel comfortable. It could be school counselor. It could be a teacher. Uh, but finding a caring adult um, uh, to, to share that, uh, you know, kind of opening that opportunity if they don't know what to do and giving them options to try to reach out to someone to share what's going on. Uh, and, and, you know, main, respecting their confidentiality, if there's something they are worried about letting you know whether that's going to disappoint you or make you upset. It's, it's a hard thing, but I think um, definitely, um, you know, definitely uh, allowing them to find another avenue to open up. Uh, and not really forcing because if they're not doing it, they're not going to, you know, do it, but allowing them to say, okay, if not me. Let's have you, you know, talk to somebody else. Um, sometimes, you know, kids do better with uh, if they don't want to like do face to face conversation, they want to write a letter or write, you know, something instead um, and mention what, what they are going through or text you instead if that's less kind of anxiety inducing. That could be another way. Um, I have also, you know, um, uh, you know, seen success with like sometimes when you're like pressing them in the moment to tell you what's wrong they may not but then if you let it slide for a bit in a sense that don't you know pick that moment but let's say over the weekend or when you're both relaxed and you're like let's go for a walk and talk about other things don't kind of go with that agenda that this is what I'm going to ask as a first question but having a more kind of regular bonding time and then kind of seeing and in telling them that this is something I'm seeing. Am I reading it wrong? Am I reading it right? Is there something I need to be concerned about? Is there something I can help you with? So kind of doing a little bit of skillful thing like that can help uh, sometimes. Um, so yeah, I, it, it's, it is tricky, but I think uh, if you're sensing something is off, you should definitely find ways to, to find that out and, and offer different options. Um, the next question is, uh, what are your suggestions for helping a child sleep who struggles with anxiety and can't get out of her head? Mm. Yeah, so, you know, um, we definitely uh, see benefit from like what we call as relaxation exercises, um, you know, for, for anxiety around sleep time. Uh, so there is one, I, I'm sure you guys know about this, but I'm going to kind of quickly review it. It's called progressive muscle relaxation exercise. So just like I was sharing in my slides, like when those stress hormones are flowing, when we are ready to kind of face the world and deal with different stress, our muscles, you know, tighten up in that process. You know, that's why there's muscle tension and aches and pains we often feel when we are stressed or anxious. So 
you know, the idea is to kind of, you know, when, when our system is, if some, I'm, I'm worried about something, there's a constant stimulus that there is something fearful out there or some, there's some threat. So again, that reptilian brain that we have, which we, the old brain, which, you know, in the old times in, in the caves, it was helpful for us to fight, flight, freeze. That still remains, uh, even though our, you know, we've, 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 we've developed and we have a very smart prefrontal cortex that helps us to problem solve and whatnot. But unfortunately, in reaction to any stress, that's the first, you know, the, the old brain is the one that starts to, to give that message there's a threat and it doesn't differentiate if it's a small threat or a real threat or a bad, you know, or something it's really threat, threat or not. It, the, it gives the same message, mm, something is not good. And then you, your body, you know, goes through that cascade of stress hormones and that leads to the whole, you know, disturbance in, in your, in your day-to-day -day functioning. So based on how our physiology drives that cascade of physio like physical response with you know muscle tension and you know acid reflux you know or sleep disturbance or you know trouble breathing whatever that might be feeling dizzy um, we know that doing certain types of exercises helps us reverse that cascade and break its effects so progressive muscle relaxation is an exercise that actually does that. What we do in that is that uh, the idea is to, you know, um, start deep breathing. And then uh, after a couple deep breaths, on your next inhalation, you're tightening your toes of your feet. And as you're exhaling, you're kind of relaxing and letting go. And you're basically progressing from toes to ankle muscles. So next set would be another couple of deep breaths and then breathe in and tighten your ankle muscles and then relax and let go as you're exhaling and then moving to calves, knees, thigh muscles, arms, front, back, head, and even the face. So it's called progress. I think you should also be able to find it on the internet, but there are also um, apps, you know, uh, now for a lot of similar exercises, there's Headspace, there is Calm, there is uh, Smile. Um, UCLA actually has a free app. Uh, it's called UCLA Mindful, which has a, 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 you know, great, some basic mindful meditation exercises, breath-based. And again, the, they are all breath-based along with muscular kind of system being involved, um, mostly because we know that that's the way to reverse uh, that sympathetic overdrive that's driving so much stress and anxiety needs to be cooled down by Im improving the parasympathetic system, uh, you know, to, to get over it. And breathing helps us doing that. Being mindful helps us doing that. But, um, you know, I think uh, the kids really like these exercises for even younger kids. We simplify and we say you can do this really fun kind of exercise, you become tight like a robot, take a breath in and really stiff and tight like a robot and then breathe out and become a rag doll. So robot, rag doll, robot, rag doll. This could be also a quick way to do that same thing. Again, essentially, you know, you're telling, you know, your body that it's, it's not a real threat, it's okay, you know, it's time to kind of to relax and, and, and once your level of anxiety goes down, then the emotional brain that's hijacking your logical brain starts to calm down. And then the logical brain, like if you're trying to problem solve or say logically, you know, we no, there are no break-ins in our neighborhood. Why are you worried about somebody's going to break in the house? For example, if, if your child has that fear of or anxiety, you may say it when in the thick of the anxiety, when their emotional brain is, you know, overpowering the logical brain, which is what happens with, with the whole sympathetic drive and the stress response I illustrated. Um, you're, you're not, anything you say is not going to make sense. But once you do some behavioral techniques like breathing, calming down, and the logical brain is more open, that's when those logical reasonings are going to make a difference. So, you know, this whole therapy is called cognitive behavioral therapy, where you are bringing in the behavioral techniques like relaxation exercises, breathing techniques, mindfulness, and then you're bringing the logic and rationale. And that's when, you know, that seems to be the best, the most evidence-based therapy that helps, you know, um, cure anxiety or, or reduce anxiety.
So definitely, um, you know, try have them do this. Um, some kids like listening to calm music and, and they, you know, they find that as a way to kind of breathe and sleep. Some kids actually like listening to audio books that can distract their mind and, um, you know, they get engaged in another story and, and they can kind of let go of their worry. So those are also some other ideas you could try. This actually tied in really well with the next question, which was, are there some exercises or techniques we can do together with our kids regularly to help them center their thoughts and anxieties and find better ways to channel that anxiety? And I think what you just shared with us are some of those tools. Before I go back to the Google form, I have a question. Is distraction a good tool or does distraction just mask th things temporarily and buries them somewhere deep and they come back, that comes back later? Because yeah. I, I often go back and forth as a parent myself on, should we address the root cause here or should we distract right now? Yeah, no, great question. Uh, so, you know, distraction is one of the tools, but it uh, it shouldn't be the first tool uh, in, in a sense that like, you know, um, I, I, or I, I should take that back. I think it depends on how bad the anxiety moment is for your child in that moment, right? So if, if I am so anxious and panicked that I'm freaking out, um, you know, if you uh, distract me and say, okay, oh, you know, don't worry about this, do this. Um, may maybe that would help me temporarily to like shift my attention and maybe help me kind of come down from that heightened state of anxiety. But, you know, when I'm, you know, just uh, worrying about something and you just say distract, like, let's, let's go and watch uh, the show or let's go and watch this game. Uh, without checking in and processing or validating what I'm worried about or what I'm going through may not be as effective because, you know, like you said, like we can distract ourselves, we can kind of sub suppress those things, but then when I have free time again, it's going to come back, right? And so, so again, you know, you, you don't have to do it in the moment, depending on kind of getting the pulse of the situation and how your child is you can do a whole debriefing kind of discussion if, if it allows, but if not, you can distract. And then, because again, you know, the idea is that the, the that emotional thermometer of anxiety, you know, if it's too high, like if, if the emotional brain is overpowering your logical brain, no matter what you say at that time is not going to work. So all the talking and processing and validating stuff works well when you are more calm when so so distraction is a very effective tool uh, and and we we kind of say okay breathe distract and then when you when you have the time when you're calm then you know use your techniques um you know there is like what ifs is like a very common what if this, what if that happens is a very common anxiety, you know, like we are always worried, what if there's a new stream? What if there is shutdown of, of you know, school again? What if we go online again? Um, so, of course, when we are thinking that, you know, that we, are, we, are, we are ramping up in our emotional state, but when I, you know, take a step back and deep breath, okay, let me see, is this really a valid worry for me to have right now let me become a detective of my thought there's a technique called as detective thinking where we become detectives of, of our own thoughts because thoughts drive feelings feelings drive behavior so if i can take a step back and say okay is this something i really need to be so worried about like i'm just getting terrified by this thought but let me see what are the real reasons i should be worried about this and if i make two columns evidence for and evidence against, just like how a detective would do, you know, what's the evidence for me to feel like this is likely to going to happen? And what's the evidence that it is less like or not likely to happen? And more often than not, I'm not saying it will be always, but more often than not, you'll be surprised when you actually start writing it down, the list on the evidence against seems to be generally higher than on the ex evidence for. And 
even that can help me shake my 100% belief in that thought that was driving the level of anxiety. If I'm now feeling like the probability of this seems slightly less this time, even if I'm convinced about that, I'm not saying you say, oh yeah, it's never going to happen. You, you mean, maybe we won't come to that, but the probability of this seems like, you know, very low or less, that even can help me be more objective and say, hmm, there's a chance there could be a new strain in three months, but, you know, like less likely in the next three months or whatever. So my summer plans are okay, or my, I'm okay for this or whatever, you know, I can make a little bit of peace and I can take a step back and say, okay, let me be in the moment and do this right now and then worry about it when it comes. It goes back to the idea of what you started with when you were talking about the brain has patterns and our repetitive behaviors like being anxious. So maybe this could be a way of just nudging the pattern apart aside a little bit. So mm -hmm. thank you. Uh, another question came in. Uh, my 14 year old daughter finds herself not fit in the stereotype as a teen girl, not interested in boys, fashion, celebrities, etc. One day she declared she's a romance and then a romance and asexual. Only then I learned she had consumed lots of LGBTQA contents online during the pandemic without my knowledge. I think it's too early to declare her identity. But my disagreement is causing a lot of stress to her. Uh, any advice, please? Mm. So this is another real issue that we are seeing a lot more, uh, you know, in this past year. Uh, so, of course, you know, there is something about the social media content that can uh, absolutely influence um, our thinking and kids thinking even more so. Uh, but I also want to say that, you know, this is a kind of a gray area, uh, you know, we don't know, I'll tell you from my experience in, in terms of what I'm seeing in the last few years, with, with this more of, you know, kids coming out and talking about their identity or their preference, I think you know, that like, you know, any other, uh, like, you know, there, there, there was like this, like, you know, is the autism really rising or are we diagnosing it more? You know, is, is like, why is there these numbers going high? Are we doing more testing? Are people becoming more aware? And that's why it's coming out or it is, you know, something else. So similar to that, like, I think because there has been more voice and and openness and recognition about this in the current generation. A uh, lot of kids are being more open about it and coming out. Uh, and I'm not saying that you, know, you should be accepting or disagreeing. You know, I think it's very hard as a parent to do that. But I can tell you that it's a spectrum. Like what we are seeing is that this could be a phase. This could be something actually that's going to evolve and become a bigger deal or be, you know, become not bigger deal in a wrong way. Like it can be a, a thing that they may say, this is exactly what I'm sure about right now for myself. Uh, or this could be, you know, um, you know, it could, it could just um, evolve and say, okay, yeah, I went through that phase and now I feel differently about this. So I, I think as a parent, it's again, very hard uh not ex not diseg like i think having a more neutral stance and allowing uh you know the process to happen might be a better stance than rejecting or accepting at this point um because you know again um like i said this is a very precarious age they're trying to fit themselves find themselves fit in in the world um, if they are they are feeling like oh yeah this is the group I feel like I belong and that's the curiosity they are demonstrating I think it's okay to allow for that to happen for them to figure it out than influencing and blaming other things about it I mean I, I, I again I'm not saying the social media or the content that's out there is is not responsible there's definitely influence of that but um I, you know, I have seen various different outcomes uh, um, for this and, you know, having that broader perspective that this could evolve and could land in a different place uh, will be a better kind of mindset than feeling like this is it and I need to prevent from this happening. Are there some uh, things parents can say to their children? Do you have some 
vocabulary that you could share with us that might how do you, yeah to help one be neutral yeah you know i think you know if you think about this age again they are trying to really be accepted right like that's the that's a teenager that's a preteen and teen these you know i mean we've gone through that phase and that's kind of developmentally what they what they are looking for so um in a kind of that validation listening to them validation and acceptance is what they are looking for so i would i would you know use terms like oh thank you for sharing what your preferences are uh and uh, you know without saying oh i agree with you and this is what you are versus i deny that you're not this but just saying you know okay i heard it and and i get it and you know let's keep talking about it let's explore this further and see what happens and it, it, not an easy thing you know a lot, lot of a lot of us might feel like oh my gosh uh, is this like going to just go in the wrong direction but i have to say i've worked with few teens and you know and few different kids from different cultural backgrounds and it has changed like for a lot of them it was an issue for a year and the next year it, it evolved or they may become more more uh, uh, more sure about it but you know giving them the support to talk to a neutral person like a therapist because if you feel like this is too much for me to listen to and that stirs up anxiety for myself then finding a person to talk to and help them figure out and navigate this journey is a much better idea than you trying to stir it in either direction got it quick question i know we are running out of time uh, at schools masks are not mandatory anymore but my sixth grader still wears it all day and even bikes home after school wearing his mask how much should we push him to take it off more often i think uh, you know there is no right and wrong in this right i mean if he feels comfortable and i'm amazed uh, at kids you know from younger kids to high sc- high schoolers like so many of them have become so comfortable wearing it all day i can't wear it for a few hours uh, so i am like I have a new appreciation for how like quickly they have adapted to this if if they are feeling comfortable if they feel like this is my way of protecting myself i think it's okay to let it be uh unless you feel like oh that's you know preventing them from being singled out or like they're getting affected socially which is not the case i see a lot of kids wearing masks still at school and so just like you know during the pandemic like some people didn't step out and some did a little bit and some had double masks and some didn't have a mask there was a variance um but you know so that's the variance we all have different perspective about this our comfort level differs and letting the person be with, with their comfort might not be a bad idea to let it be and let them figure it out <laughs> follow up comment on this is this is very common now at cms some peer pressure to keep it on that's what my eighth graders are saying is that right maybe there is a peer pressure part to it hmm. but you know it's not i mean i guess looking at the pros and cons it's not something uh, that that worries some i guess to to worry about um does it, does anxiety manifest itself differently in girl, teenage girls and boys it does uh in in a sense that you know there are different flavors to anxiety um you know there is something called as generalized anxiety which is this excessive worrying kind of anxiety some people have this more out you know outburst of anxiety in terms of panic attacks some may have social anxiety which is like they find at other times but socially they feel judged or feel like they're not um being accepted or they will be not accepted and there's a lot of anxiety about that so generally we see uh generalized and more social anxiety often in girls uh not to say that we don't see it in boys but there is definitely a little bit more uh, of the social anxiety for sure we see a bit more in girls than boys um yeah thank you um uh, my eighth grader is still very active in sports but as soon as he is home he loves to hang in his bedroom i know he spent a lot of time in his room when classes were all online last year so is this something normal it's absolutely normal <laughs> i know we you know uh, don't we want kids to spend time with us and i think we should definitely encourage them to do that so certainly 
uh, you your concern is certainly valid that you feel like oh you know why are they isolating i think that's kind of again a developmental change that these the kids go through at this age they're trying to go towards that autonomy and want to find uh, find their own downtime or do things on their own but again keeping eye on what they are engaging in if they are isolating they're locking up their room and if you're concerned about like their their friend group or what they are up to and and so certainly um keeping an eye on safety stuff and making sure uh, they are being alone not just for downtime but other you know if there are other concerns then obviously but encouraging them i mean i think um you know as parents obviously we want them to spend time with us and it's okay as a parent to put your foot down and say we would love for you to sit and have dinner with us every night or after dinner come and spend few minutes to hang out in the room and do your work i think it's totally appropriate to do that and giving them some time kind of finding that balance where they get their some oh, me time and then you are also getting some family time okay thank you um i think this should probably be our last question we are almost out. we are out of time but i'll read this one out my son is very addicted to devices and does not socialize with school peers after school hours uh, he doesn't really he's not into social media just addicted to his online friend um not hand in his school uh, work very often feels that school is useless he expresses he learned nothing at school all things he can learn online but i think his major issue is socializing with real pe person because in real life he has to deal with people surrounding him he doesn't like but online he can choose people uh, he only wants to hang out with uh, i i hear your concern and unfortunately again that has been a big drawback that has you know come out related to the pandemic that um, even prior to pandemic we had screen addiction issues in some kids but this has definitely gone up because that became the means of education interaction everything in in the last year and a half to two and so you know i, I we are definitely seeing there's been loss of social skills you know in that span that kids because they didn't have that opportunity or for safety reasons they didn't interact they they've gotten comfortable with this modality of of interaction so everything is like easier online it's so much hard work to go and interact and get along and listen to others and in and, and all of that so so there is definitely a factor that's that's made it worse i would say but at the same time i would say this is certainly your concern about him to be ready for the real world is valid uh, we can't let this slide and say okay he's going to be just like this and always be online um so you know uh, there are therapists uh, and you can email me and i'll put my email i can send you some resources there is something called as internet addiction like gaming disorder or like you know that we understand that can you know just how you know other addictions happen this can be a, a thing also so there are therapists who specialize and work with parents and teens of the older teen especially they work just with the teen and they will find a way to help him break this pattern uh and and kind of uh, help them change that behavior again you know we kind of get into this habituated into a certain comfort zone and behavior and we feel like that that's our world that's like the that's how how i function but you know understandably that's not how we function uh we need him to get ready for the real world so getting intervention to uh break that pattern and getting him out slowly and steadily would be a, a good idea and i can um put my email in the chat box here thank you dr sanjeev i just send it to cindy i should yeah we maybe yeah i think i was uh... all right thank you guys uh, hopefully this was helpful i know uh, we chose to do it differently this time i know there's always lots of questions parents have so i thought this would be more helpful and hopefully it was this was very helpful and i think you very patiently answered all our questions and concerns and collectively you know we're all uh, you're probably seeing in the chat uh thank you very much for coming
one person asks, but we all have similar issues. So thanks a lot. Yeah, yeah. You know, common humanity, right? We all are parents and kids are kids. <laughs> all right. Thank you, guys. Have a good night. Good night. Bye, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Um, Thank you. And Bye. let us know if there are any other uh, subjects you want uh, CMSPTO to organize parent talks around. Uh, we would be happy to do that. Um, our, Cindy's email address, Cindy, your email address or mine should be uh, online. Otherwise, I can also write my email address. Feel free to email Cindy, me, anybody else from the PTO. Um, if there are other things you would like us to arrange talks around. Thank you for coming. Good night, everyone. Bye. Thank you.